2019. Uh, we're starting earlier than we normally do, um, just because of the RDA meeting that we will have. Uh, we, will, we will be stopping um, promptly at five minutes to two. Um, so that we can uh, get resituated for the RDA meeting. So whatever discussion we are having, um, we will just put a pin in that and then come back uh, and finish after the meeting. So or the RDA meeting. So the first item on our agenda, um, I'm actually going to switch things around a little bit um, because we are slated to vote tonight on our CIP uh, project budget and so we will uh, address this first i do want to excuse uh, james rogers who will be here later uh, he is out at the county uh, right now for uh, a hearing that they are are having on another subject so um, at the table uh, we have ben lutke uh, who's our office policy analyst um, ben will will kind of lead us through uh, this discussion and then we also have Dan Rip and Jennifer McGrath from the administration. Um, so one, the way that I'd like this discussion to go, Ben, if you could, if you could kind of pick up where we left off uh, when we last had this discussion, um, there was an unfunded uh, list uh, that we uh, straw polled and and created. Um, Based on that meeting and, you know, understanding that we still need to have, that we will have further discussion, we talked about these items, uh, thank you, uh, we talked about these items a couple of weeks ago, but um, these are the projects that were unfunded that uh, us as council um, pulled aside and uh, prioritized for funding. Um, I asked, after that meeting, I asked um, Ben and staff uh, to look for uh, any available um, way to fund all of those projects um, that, that were set aside, not knowing if that was going to be possible. Um, you know, basically I asked, I asked them to look under all of the couch cushions for any loose change. Um, and surprisingly, um, surprisingly not because, you know, they're not great, but uh, surprisingly they were able to fund or find enough funding uh, to take care of everything. Uh, that includes some new uh, revenue uh, that came in uh, for parks impact fees that Ben will talk about, uh, but it also includes uh, moving um, money from some budgets to fund, uh, from, to fund roads, for example, road projects that, uh, that were originally, uh, we were just thinking for general CIP. So Ben, do you wanna um, walk us through the unfunded list um, and, then, and then talk about uh, the mechanisms that, that staff was able to identify to um, come up with the funding to deal with these. Sure thing. Thank you. Uh, on page two of the staff report, if you'd like to reference your seven straw polls from the August 6th briefing, they are listed on that page. Also listed are the five unfunded uh, want list projects. The five projects were number 35, Three Creeks Confluence, Number 36, the Yale Crest Historic Signage. Number 44, the Jordan Park Boat Access Ramp. Number 49, the Connecting Corridor for Sorensen Multicultural and Unity Center. And number 50, the Community Parks Signage and Wayfinding. And this would be at 10 different parks across the city. As the chair mentioned, there was almost a million dollars, 980,000 in parks impact fees that came in over a two week period. Impact fees, not just parks, but all impact fees are a volatile revenue source. They fluctuate up and down based on the building permits that are issued, as well as the specifics of those projects. So the number of bedrooms or the number of square feet. So this was a, a large update. The funds, the revenues are new since the council originally decided how much money to put into the CIP budget during the annual budget deliberations back in May and June. The straw polls, which are shown on page one of the staff report, would maximize these parks impact fees. And so the first question is, does the council want to recognize this increase in parks impact fees? If the answer is affirmative, there is a list of four projects that are 100% eligible for parks impact fees, but are currently listed to be funded with general fund dollars. 
this would allow you to free up general fund dollars, the most flexible dollars you have in CIP that can go to any project. You would then take those general fund dollars in the third straw poll in combination with 281,000 in streets impact fees. Those streets impact fees would free up additional general fund dollars and this would allow you to fund the five projects that did not have funding but you identified as wanting to fund at your last briefing. Okay, so does that, does that make sense? So any, any discussion, um, so first off, did, um, if anyone has any questions, uh, Council Member Johnston. Yeah, I had a question about the impact fees. I know we have a capital improvements plan going forward for multiple years, um, but it's not very detailed as far as I'm aware. Do we have anything more detailed that would help us understand if we utilize all the available impact fees this year, essentially down to zero, um, what doesn't happen next year perhaps? Do we have anything like that? So uh, I should clarify that the 980,000 in parks impact fees would still leave 2 million in parks impact fees available for a property purchase elsewhere in the city. So it would be maximizing the parks impact fees above that 2 million. The city does have a capital facilities plan draft, which was transmitted in October last year, and it has 10 years of capital projects. Uh, it hasn't been adopted by the council. Uh, you gave direction about changes and additions, uh, and that discussion hasn't come back to the council yet. And it does list categories of improvements, such as two soccer fields a year, or adding an acre of open space per year, but it doesn't have individual projects, and they're not prioritized. So if it's helpful, uh, I could pull up the, the list to see what was envisioned for parks projects over the next 10 years, uh, but it's generally broad categories. Is there any more detail, Jen, you might have? Um, I think the only other thing that I would add is we are, um, we received funding this year through the budget to update the impact fee facility plan, um, which we're about to get under contract on and start that work so that we can update that list. Um, and then also I mentioned, I don't know, one or two work sessions ago, um, the work we're doing to try to update our property list. Um, and we're trying to put all of that into one, one system so that we have all of that in one place so we can do an analysis and really be more proactive. But that's not something that's going to happen overnight. That's going to take a few months for us to get there. Okay. Um, so that will be happening uh, concurrently with the work on the IFFP update. Okay. There's also... Uh a parks needs assessment that I believe public services has been working on. I'm not sure of the status, but that would certainly inform the parks capital needs in the 10 yeah. year plan. My only concern was just um, if we're going to un unintendedly hamstring ourselves next year financially for some reason, um, not knowing that something was else was there to be done, we'd have the, the impact fees for it. And I think it's fair to say that there, there are things that we can't predict. Um, we have things come up all the time. I think um, what's happened at the water park is a great example. We can have some things come up that end up being really big expenses that we don't anticipate. And so, you know, having some flexibility is always a good thing. There are also other options than the three straw polls uh, on the first page of the staff report. The council, instead of maximizing the parks impact fees, you could use more streets impact fees to free up general fund dollars instead. Uh, you could use a combination of parks and street impact fees. Parks impact fees are generally the easiest to spend uh, because they're just more flexible uh, in the city's impact fee facilities plan. Okay, other, oh yeah, go ahead, Cindy. As a city, I think we've had a history of not realizing that parks impact fees are available to spend. And so there have been times when general fund money is recommended either through or, or RDA uh, money has been recommended for use when uh, park impact fee money could be used. So in a way there's, that comes kind of at the back end of the process and I know the administration is, is working to put that at the front end of the process, but there have been cases where we could have spent these funds on parks and um, used general fund or RDA instead. Other questions from the council? Or discussion. 
Okay, so let's uh, let's go ahead then and and go through these straw polls. Um, first off, does the council want to recognize the increase of nine hundred and eighty thousand four hundred and sixty seven dollars in parks impact fees for the fiscal year twenty CIP budget? Thumbs up that we support that. Thumbs down that we oppose that. Okay, and that is unanimous with uh, James absent. Uh, the second question, does the council want to use the new parks impact fees to free up general fund dollars? The remaining $219,297 of park impact fees, 980,467 subtract 761,170, will partially fund projects number 44, the Jordan River boat access ramp, and number 50, community park signage and wayfinding. The general Pro the general fund project funding that will be freed up includes $761,170 total. Um, thumbs up that we support that, thumbs down that we oppose it. And that is also unanimous. Uh, the third straw poll, does the council want to add $281,690 in streets impact fees to free up general fund dollars? Uh, the affected projects are um, number 30 on our list, uh, street improvement up or reconstruction, number 24, traffic signal upgrades, number 37, Wasatch Hollow Phase 2, and number 50, community park signage and wayfinding. Uh, yes, Council Member Mendenhall. Uh, Mr. Chair or Ben, items C and D on that list do not seem uh, necessarily along the lines of what we committed the streets impact fees for. A and B, I understand. Can you uh, remind me or tell us how Wasatch Hollow phase two and the community park signage relates to our streets impact fee commitments? So you're correct that those two projects are not eligible for street impact fees. What this motion does is it takes street impact fees and spends it on projects that are eligible for street impact fees, but are- In order to make the general fund dollars available for these. That is correct. They're currently funded with class C funds. Funding ah. them with street impact fees instead allows you to shift the funds to free up the general fund dollars. Thank you, that makes sense. Okay, uh, any other questions about this? Uh, thumbs up that we support that straw poll. Uh, thumbs down that we oppose it. And that is unanimous uh, with James being absent. Okay, so those are, so that then successfully um, shifts that money around, spending money on, on certain things to free up uh, impact fee money. Uh, through the unfunded list, um, the items that we did not um, straw poll last week uh, were uh, the three, three Creeks Confluence, Phase 3, number 35. The Yalecrest Historic Signage, number 36. Jordan River Boat Access Ramp, number 44. Connecting Corridor for Sorensen Multicultural and Unity Center, number 49. And Community Park Signage and Wayfinding, number 50. Um, does anybody have questions uh, about any of these items that we, uh, that we straw pulled to add to this unfunded list a couple of meetings ago. Okay, so if there, if there are no further discussions, um, understanding that, um, that the revenue is now there to fund each of these, um, my straw poll would be um, that we add, or, or that we officially um, add those five items to our approved unfunded list um, thumbs well they will be funded so that the unfunded the unfunded list is what we what we came up with and that was the um, those items this would this would just add that and 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 take the list that we the unfunded list and, and essentially fund it so thumbs up that we uh, approve those uh, fund, funding for those projects thumbs down that we oppose that and that is unanimous. So, um, Ben, are there other items that uh, that we need to address on this on the CIP plan before we vote tonight? Uh, 
You've funded all of the projects that you identified uh, the, on the want list. You've added additional funding to CIP above what was originally done in the annual budget. And we'll do the accounting step in budget amendment number one to confirm those numbers are added into CIP. Great. So tonight, Council, um, the, uh, our, our motions will uh, include um, everything that we talked about today and last week. Um, I just I want to thank all of you for um, your work in, in digging through uh, these items. Um, this is um, one of the first times that we've actually been able to um, fund the entire unfunded uh, want list that, uh, that, we've, that we've come up with. And so um, thank you all for, for picking these items and, and, I'm, and, and I'm choosing the lucky these charm. items. But I also want to thank staff for um, really, you know, digging in and, and figuring out how we could accomplish this. So, so thank you. Council Member Valdemoros. I'm the lucky charm. You, uh, <laughs> on, uh, yeah. So congratulations to Council Member Valdemoros. <laughs> Can I <laughs> ask a quick Fallon. question? And I apologize. Um, the um, number 50 community park signage and wayfinding, you, Ben, you said that there were 10 or so parks that these would go to. Is that listed in our packet somewhere that I can go back and find that list? Uh, yeah, I believe it is one of the attachments. Okay, I can look for it later. Attachment 14. Thank you. That's why I love you. Councilmember Johnston. Mr. Chair, I've been asked for a simplified version of what we've now agreed to. It's changed over several weeks, <laughs> and uh, we've had a lot of different iterations of this. Is there any a simplified version of now, based on our straw poll, exactly what is funded at what level? I am glad you asked. Uh, I just want to touch on we've done expanded outreach on CIP this year. There's been an open city hall. We've had over 150 people attend the open city hall. Uh, 22 of them left comments. It amounts to about an hour and a half of uh, public comment. And f I know several of them are listening right now because they've contacted the office. We'll be sending out a single page summary of which projects are gonna be implemented by which department and how much funding, if in any, the council approved. So I'll be finalizing that right after the briefing. Will we be able to get a sneak peek before our formal meeting tonight? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Councilmember Mendenhall. Oh, no, okay. Councilmember, um, any other council questions or comments? Councilmember Fowler. Great. All right. Well, thank you all and staff again. Thank you very much, uh, both council staff and administrative staff for uh, all of your work on this project. So the next item that we will talk about is uh, listed as item number one on our work session agenda, the fiscal year 2020 budget holding account funding our future housing programs. Um, Jennifer McGrath will remain at the table. Um, and then Allison Rowland from the council office is our policy analyst. Uh, she will walk us through this. Uh, Lanny Egertson Goff is going to join us. She's the director of hand. And Jennifer Schumann, the deputy director of hand, will also join us. Oh, Jennifer will not be here. She's, she, will, she will be there. Um, all right, so Allison, I'll turn the time over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is, as you may recall, the uh, continuation of the conversation you began during the, the FY20 budget uh, discussions. You had some questions about some of the details of housing programs funded from the Funding Our Future sales tax revenue stream. And the uh, HAND and CAN have been very helpful in clarifying those that information for your review. I also want to mention um, the attorney's office has just provided a draft ordinance for you to review. Um, this wouldn't be for adoption tonight, but the idea is to have this draft ordinance available for you. I just uh, forwarded it to you in email so that uh, when you're ready for that, you can make sure that the ordinance does fit in. And of course, we'll be taking a look at that from the staff side as well. Um, apart from that, I believe, uh, this is Jennifer and Lonnie's game, so uh, I'll let them talk. Thank you, Allison. Thank you um, for having us here. I know it's been a busy month for you all, council, um, chair, especially for allowing us to work through this uh, Funding Our Future process. <coughs> and a really big shout out to the staff, um, Cindy and Jen Bruno and Allison have been very helpful in working through this process. So um, I would like to just kind of 
outline what we want to cover in this short period of time. I know you have a hard stop at 2 o'clock. Um, maybe point out some of the changes between the fiscal year 1819 and the current uh, funds that are in the unappropriated holding account. And then um, work through the process. Um, all of the items that I intend to talk about were in your packet along with the um, briefing uh, transmittal. So um, we can get into more detail and questions um, after I go through those kind of high level things. Mm -hmm. Does that sound okay? Yep, perfect. So this one's a lot of words um, and it might be a little tough to see on the big screen. Um, really we wanted to go through and, and um, acknowledge the concerns around the process. This is all new to all of us um, for funding our future for sales tax. We're extremely grateful for the possibility of using these funds for our community. And we wanna just make sure that everyone is clear on what the processes will look like. So for this year, um, obviously we're getting towards September. We wanna make sure that we allow for maybe an abbreviated process, but then be prepared for a full you know, annual process um, as we go along. So rather than read all of that that is on the screen, I just want to point out that we have um, looked at ways for the administration and council to work together on this process. And um, yeah, I'm going to just switch to the illustration rather than all the words. <coughs> um, looking at an application <coughs> process, we do this um, in relation to our federal dollars uh, all the time for CDBG, HOME, HOPWA, other uh, ESG, <coughs> and we utilize Zoom grants for that process to allow people access um, to apply for funds. We would like to somehow accomplish that in August, September, coming right up. Um, looking through uh, applications, have a shorter window maybe this year than um, we would propose for future years and then uh, making sure they uh, align with growing SLC and other funding our future goals that the council has um, identified as priority areas. So then we would go through a review prioritization, um, bring that back to you as council to review our um, applications and the uh, um, community partners uh, proposals for use of this uh, money and um, have a public hearing if that is desired by a council and then you would um, determine if we can appropriate, if you would like to appropriate those funds. Um, there would be uh, management of funding agreements that happens similar to how we do it within hand, um, making sure that we work with our attorneys and um, with our uh, potential recipients of the money. Um, we obviously would need to do that quickly again in the next month or so if we're going to utilize FY2021 dollars no, FY1920, sorry. And then we would get into more normal uh, annual process going forward from there. Obviously, interspersed, uh, we would do updates for the council and for the community to identify how we've uh, utilized funds and um, leverage monies that are really amazing to have that don't have the requirements attached that federal dollars do. So around this process, are there any questions before I go on to the council? I think we're okay. Oh, nope, we're good. Oh, yeah. I there. see, question. I knew I knew someone was. So, <laughs> council member of all the more. I have a question. Um, I'm always thinking about practicality, <coughs> and uh, as I'm um, sorry, I'm just always thinking about practicality. Like if I had to go through Certainly. this, or if I was to encounter somebody that was experiencing <coughs> homelessness, how would they approach us and what are the steps? So one of the things that I'm working on, um, this is on private business, but um, we're trying to have a pilot program from with some of the homeless um, youth that we have uh, at the resource center. We're trying to provide some employment for them with my businesses, but some of them, uh, right, as of today, you know, they're homeless or waiting for rehousing or they don't know where to go. They just know that. We're in that process. Somewhere in that mm -hmm. process. Um, for employment, like how are we going to check their employment status? Like are we looking at paychecks only and that, that's what qualifies them to apply for this house 20 
uh, for example, or how is that? Do they come to the city and they say, hey, I'm experiencing homelessness? Honestly, um, we deal mostly with employment income related um, documents for our rehabilitation program or our um, mortgage uh, programs, which are you know, long term, long going, ongoing um, programs that we do within hand. Mm -hmm. um, for House 20, it's um, based on um, the status of homelessness, okay. right? And um, really looking at how to partner folks that don't fit the housing and urban development or HUD um, definition mm -hmm. to be able to, to share a housing unit. So for what we do here, there would be like down payment assistance, things that we'd look at income, but not necessarily related to em employment. Okay. Is that helpful? So, yeah. So and in House 20, I heard you mention, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, House 20 is for our 20 um, heaviest users of emergency okay. services. Right. Um, so that's not really employment based either. And then the rent assistance, you have another program for the rent assistance. Right. So that would be um, for those that are um, we have a couple of different kinds. There's the emergency rent assistance, which um, we're trying to get all of the terminology to be the same, <laughs> <laughs> formerly known as incentivized rent. Okay. Um, those are for folks that need, like maybe they have a medical expense that they're having to choose between they're paying their medical expense and rent. We would help them with a short-term emergency assistance in that way. But they could just walk over to your office and talk to someone. <laughs> Is that how I'd it I'd be happy to. Okay. Um, yes. Mr. That's Chair? something that Oh, okay. sorry if that's problematic. Can you hear me better, Corey? Okay. Okay, uh, Council Member Mendenhall and then Council Member Johnston. Yeah, two questions. One was on the incentivized rent assistance <laughs> program, and I wonder um, if there are other programs like this in the county or at the state level, and how you'll prioritize access to those funds. There are not other county or state that I'm aware of that do this kind of emergency rent assistance. What are you modeling it after? Well, from community input, um, knowing that we have folks that are really on the fringes of homelessness, um, and, and those telling us, our housing advocates saying, there isn't a mechanism to help these folks in this situation, and using those dollars to make that gap be filled. So we don't have a, a model, best practices. McGrath is gonna help me here, I think. <laughs> I think um, you know we're we're trying to come at this from from two different angles. What we want to do is we want to fund programs that already exist in the community that are working, that we know have really good outcomes. We want to support those programs, help build them up, and expand the reach of those programs. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we want to do is identify gaps within the community. What are the things that are coming to light, but nobody is providing assistance, that there isn't a program existing for these things. And that's where this one falls in. And I think um, what we have realized is, you know, our professionals, you know, came to the table and said, we have these gaps in the community, and this is really where we should focus some energy. And that's kind of what we were hearing from our community partners. And just recently, in the last few weeks, Thanks to Council Member Johnston, he, you know, he forwarded some information to us from uh, someone that he knows who's an attorney and um, a nonprofit advocate. And he identified in that email the exact two gaps that we're trying to fill with these two new programs, which what that tells us is we are on the right track. We have identified the exact same gaps that the people who are closest to this on the ground are seeing. And what we're really looking forward to today and in the future is working with you all to help solidify what that looks like, what the criteria are, and get this thing really solid and get it out on the street so we can provide these dollars to the community. These are the two programs that were the least fleshed out, if you will. Um, and I think you can see, you've, we've identified in our paperwork, these are the two programs that we want to work with you on and get your feedback um, to yeah. really solidify the questions that you're asking. I appreciate that. Uh, I would like to work with you in smaller groups on this one, and I don't doubt that there's a gap and a need for this. My question is still, how will you prioritize applicants? Okay. I want to know things like so, how many times can people access this fund? If you are, is there any age um, factor in there? Is there employment status factor? I, I want. I just want to know what how you're going to approach this. And I feel like I need to clarify, Council Member Mendenhall, that we actually have three oh, unusual programs. The incentivized rent program is actually out on the 
people are using those monies right now. We did a, a RFP type process. We first called it a NOFA, but then we didn't feel like that was <laughs> appropriate for the amount of monies. Um, but we had like seven, seven um, community partners that applied for the limited dollars. And we had our criteria that our internal staff had worked on, um, again, based on community partner input, what are the things that are needed? And um, th three of those entities met the criteria and showed us that they could manifest going forward. So we have a pretty detailed policy and procedure document that we could share if that's um, yeah. of and interest. We, I'll, I'd like to just request a meeting with you to learn more about it. Great. So my other question is on the prevention and elimination of housing discrimination. I know it's new programming still t to be determined. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to insert that I hope there will be uh, some contemplation of eviction prevention services. Yes. Um, recognizing how much the state oversees our ability to affect Does the that? eviction process, yeah. there are levers that the city can use. So going forward, I'd like to learn more about how we're going to uh, use that 300,000 to address eviction prevention. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Mendenhall. Uh, Councilmember Johnston and then uh, Cindy Gus Jensen uh, wanted to clarify something and then uh, Councilmember Fowler. Does she want to clarify first? Is it more, no? Okay. Um, Councilmember Mendenhall, I, I may be off, but you may correct me, Jen and, and Lonnie. Um, when you're talking about the prevention elimination of housing discrimination, and the landlord assurance incentive program i'm not sure the first one it sounds like it is directly related to the eviction discussion is that accurate yes and reducing those barriers for um, yeah. folks to be able to get to a non-eviction okay. process yeah. yeah and i apologize those are the two programs that i was referring to that weren't as fleshed out that we want to get your feedback on so we get those right but that those are the things we've heard the, from the community where we really have gaps okay uh, the second piece, these are all going to be RFPs out to um, private agencies to administer the programs. Is that accurate? Correct. So clients would not come directly to the city to access this. They go through a, another agency. Exactly. We want to take advantage of partners that are doing either the same or similar or adjacent yeah. um, services and not reinvent things if we can avoid that. I think that. The, the timeline looks good to me. The, the third uh, question is about the case management attached to some of these. Mm -hmm. um, I just saw the one, two, three, four of the six, I believe, have case management attached to the, in that, those numbers. Have you fleshed out details about um, caseloads or uh, how are you going to track the case management attached to these, uh, these the programs? two new programs? The reason I ask that is because generally from a nonprofit perspective, you may take in, say, the $200,000 for one of these programs, which includes some case management and some direct client funds. But you may take that case management service and move it and use it for this and something else you're doing. So the case manager themselves gets split between multiple funding sources and it makes it hard to track long term. That makes Any sense. sense of that? Um, we have not gotten to that level of yeah. detail on numbers of um, folks that we anticipate would be served by a case manager based on the funding. Um, but we are in conversation with several of our partners to figure that out. Okay. Thank you. Cindy. One of the things that the administration has been able to inject into this program since you last discussed it is the concept um, for members of the public or groups of nonprofits or individual nonprofits to create their own uh, program proposals and submit those for consideration. So it will be similar to CDBG and CIP. It isn't that the people just have the opportunity to bid on what the city has thought up in collaboration with, with the providers, but also they'll be able to come up with new programs and ideas and submit those to be weighed um, by the administration, the board, I assume, and right. the council eventually. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Cindy. Councilmember Fowler. I have a couple of things. Just to clarify, the applications that we're talking about are applications for 
from the community organizers for these monies. Correct. They're not applications from citizens, uh, residents of Salt Lake City to seek money for any of these programs, right? They're exactly. RFPs. Exactly correct. correct. Okay. I, I feel like there was a little bit of confusion yeah. okay. there. That's and so I Thank wanted you. to make sure that we were all clear of what, what this was, which is great because I think we're capitalizing on community involvement and pe not, as you said, Lonnie, reinvent reinventing the will. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say is um, a, a quick thank you. I know that during the budget process, this was not fun to talk about, and there wasn't a fun time for anybody. Um, but I truly think that we, um, we did the right thing so that we can make sure that these programs are administered in the absolute best possible way so residents can really take advantage of them. And I appreciate your willingness to um, work with us, I think, uh, given how <laughs> some of that went, there could have been, uh, it could have been easy to just kind of push us out and tune us away and say not, and the cooperation and the collaboration is, is really what it's all about. And I think it just creates a space to, to have even better programming at where we're actually <coughs> looking at the outcomes. We're monitoring how people are, are benefiting from this. And we're coming back to the table with the dialogue and saying, OK, maybe we do need to tweak this a little bit because of x, <coughs> y, and z in the back, right? Um, and I appreciate that you're doing this rather quickly. I know it was kind of <laughs> stressed, but and 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 fast tracked. Yet it has the beginning components of a really good foundation for how these processes should work. Um, so I appreciate as much as heartache as I think we all went through back during our budget. I th I think the outcome is is right on track of where we want to be going. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Other uh, questions or comments on this? So we have just the two illustrations. I'll just yep. go quickly to the next one. Um, this would be a more traditional or more 12-month um, kind of picture to do. It's basically similar, just we have the timelines are not as tight as they are for this current process. Um, it is pretty much the same. One thing I did not mention initially was that we would encourage the applications to be reviewed with our Housing Trust Fund Advisory Board. So we have a Citizen Advisory Board as part of the conversation, similar to CDCIP Board for our federal dollars um, and CIP dollars. Really, that's, I mean, if, if you'd like, we can go through each of the one-page documents for each of the programs. Um, I'd be happy to do that. I think we're, <clears throat> I think we're okay unless, um Somebody else would, would like that. Um, Cindy has another clarifying. Sorry. Uh, the Landlord Guarantee Program, if you said this, I missed it, but um, council staff still thinks there is an opportunity to use the state program rather than the city funding. And so I would suggest that you kind of hold off on that one. We did have a chance to speak with David Litbeck about it. Um, the sponsor on that is uh, uh, Todd Weiler, who represents part of the city, and um, our lobbyists were thinking that they could go to him and make some recommendations based on whatever um, the administration suggests to make that um, program more viable for the use that the um, case managers and others see as a need. So that one maybe you can use the city money for something else if we can get them to change the state program. That would be great. So as we're going forward in the coming month, we'll um, try and work more quickly on understanding the sponsor and, and intentions of, at the state level. Right. Um, if we don't have any further questions, thank you uh, for your explanation and your work. And, and yeah. um, I just want to echo uh, what Councilmember Fowler had said. I know that you know this process has not been um, comfortable, but I think it has it, it it has been good to get everybody on the same page and, and ensure that you know we're all moving forward together. And so uh, I just want to thank you for. Uh, your staff's professionalism and um, and for not you know not taking this as a slight. Um, it was it was something that um, you know we felt were very legitimate uh, questions that needed to be addressed. And uh, unfortunately, the um, the the circumstances were were a bit different. So, um, Councilmember Mendenhall, and then um, David. I, I just wanted to check in. This is. 
I see that we just have our briefing scheduled today. Mm -hmm. Are, is there any other future updates or what's next? I see the timeline too, but yeah. aside from that. So, so go ahead, Cindy. Speak to that? Then, uh, we just received a resolution yesterday. Um, if the council wants, we can get this on the agenda to, um, for you to consider officially releasing the funds or the funds you're comfortable releasing, however you want to handle it. Okay. So we will, you know, I, I, my hope was not that we just hold up money. My hope was that, you know, we were able, that we would be able to work through um, the questions that we had and the policy uh, directives that we had and then move forward. So um, I, I would like to schedule something uh, sooner rather than later so that um, we can, we can move forward now that we have those questions addressed. So, uh, Councilmember Mendenhall, thank you for, uh, for raising that point. Uh, David Litback. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's exactly, uh, my question was gonna be about the process moving forward, so uh, yep. Council Member, appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah, so, um, I, yeah, so I'll, I'll work with uh, staff and, and we'll get this on, on an upcoming agenda uh, as soon as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Council Member Fowler. Larry, one more thing. Yep. I, I, I know that resolution got turned around pretty quickly, so thanks to the attorney's office for um, double timing that so that we can get it quickly on, a, on an agenda, because I know it was a qu very quick turnaround. <laughs> Probably a late really night. <laughs> for the record. <laughs> um, if I may. Please. Um, I want to thank um, Lonnie's team, who really did an incredible yep. job, but also yep. your team, um, who are always great to work with us. And I think always when we can have these kinds of conversation, we always end up with a better product. Um, and I think we were able to mirror existing processes that we have. Um, so we're not really inventing something from scratch. We're just bringing something new into a process that we already have. And so I just wanted to thank Lonnie's team and your team for really working together, collaborating on this and coming up with what I think is a really outstanding product and we'll be able to get these dollars out serving our community quickly because of that work. So thank you. Thank you. All right. So our next item is an interlocal agreement for animal control services between Salt Lake City and Salt Lake County. Uh, seeing that we would have two to, well, probably four minutes before um, the hard break, um, I will at this point just say uh, that we will uh, reconvene our uh, work session and continue our work session as soon as the RDA uh, meeting uh, has concluded. So at this point we will um, take a very brief pause to uh, move seats and turn the chair over to council or uh, to council member now board director board member Fowler. So thank you. Our work session of the Salt Lake City Council. Uh, the next item that we'll be discussing is uh, item number three on our agenda, which is a resolution, uh, an interlocal agreement for animal control services between Salt Lake City and Salt Lake County. Uh, Jan Aramaki from the council office is our resident animal uh, law expert. So uh, she will be joining us and, and will guide us through this discussion. Uh, Noel Walkinshaw, the public services deputy director, Talia Butler uh, from Salt Lake County Animal Services, and Michelle Blue from Salt Lake County Animal Services are also here. And could you introduce yourself, please? I'm yeah. Carrie Seibert, liaison coordinator for animal services. Thank you. Great. Do you want me to do a quick introduction? So what you have before you is the new interlocal agreement with Salt Lake County for animal services. Uh, the contract is set to expire September 30th of 2019 so and once you make a decision then it needs to also go before the Salt Lake County Council for consideration is that correct um, and then uh, there is a 25% increase on the contract uh, but that does not give you a higher level of service or anything um, what that gives you is um, it reflects the city's full portion of the contract and fixed costs, uh, so formerly incorporated areas of Salt Lake County were covering the fixed costs. Sorry, did I say that right? Um, but now it's going to be shared across the board with all contracted cities. And also that 25% increase will contribute towards creating a capital project reserve fund where funds will be set aside to maintain uh, and support capital needs. So I'll leave it at that. And if you have questions, I do. 
Council Member Wharton. Yeah, um, thank you. So I had a resident uh, that recently said that they got ticketed um, uh, or maybe they just got warned about um, the their dog's license having expired after one year, but they they used to have a three year expiration program. What what's going on with that? Could you answer that? Explain that? that? So approximately five years ago, we did some research and found out that it is not the industry standard to issue pet licenses beyond one year. And the point is that. Um, is really difficult to track rabies expirations from year to year. Um, the state does not allow us to legally license an animal unless its rabies vaccine remains current throughout the duration of the license period. Um, so we had some concerns that three-year licenses may not be legal for us to issue. So because of all of those concerns and being the industry standard, um, at that time about five years ago, that we, we tried to do a lot of messaging at that time and reset, reach out to people who did have those current license types and let them know that when that expired, they would have to return to a one-year license. And we, we, we tried to do as much messaging. I understand that somebody still was, was unaware of the change, but that's the reasoning for that. Okay. So. And then um, there were, um, there's, we were told there's going to be increased um, um, compliance um, efforts in Memory Grove. Um, and um, one of my constituents uh, who walks in Memory Grove frequently with his very well-behaved dog um, is frustrated because um, they said that um, my information was that this was complaint driven. Um, can you tell me, and I totally understand if you don't have it right now, but can you get to Jan or to get to me how many complaints you received about uh, Memory Grove and what what kind of complaints you were receiving um, about that or if you can speak to it today then yeah great. no we're happy to speak to that so we we actually did a press release um, about a week ago we've had numerous complaints but I'll get you the exact number um, the issue is that the off-leash area is um, being utilized for many purposes and so we're working with parks and PD to make sure that the that people stay in the off-leash area and that that area is specifically used for off-leash dogs so so it is it is a challenge and we're definitely trying to stay on top of it but parks in general are and in, you guys have a whole bunch of new off-leash areas so that is one area that has changed drastically in the last few years and and we are doing our best to stay on top of it, but it is, it's definitely a challenge and something that we see going forward is something that we'll possibly need even an increased effort in. Okay, and then last question is, I've had numerous residents come and talk to me about raccoons. Yes, that was gonna be my question. And, <laughs> and there, is, there is one that lives next door to me or something who is unrepentant <laughs> in eating my cat food. Um, and no, no, the cat food, the cat food, we have outdoor cats. And it, <laughs> for, for anyone watching now versus earlier, this is what right. city council work <laughs> sessions is, usually are these like. These are the so. real issues. You have a park in your backyard, anyway, a cat okay, park. So, so I have, I have, I have two outdoor cats that I inherited with the house, okay? Um, they are not raccoons. Sorry. They're not raccoons. There is an, a, a very bold raccoon um, that is enormous and is not afraid of people <laughs> or brooms. Um, <laughs> so, and uh, and I was telling people, yeah, there is a question. There's a point, and I do have one. Um, that I was telling Please continue, because this is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I've been telling residents to call animal control, and then they said that they did, and you don't do raccoons. So, what? so you what? guys... <laughs> what? So they can, they can call us, but we will give you guys, so that each of you have the number for the Urban Wildlife Program, so that is something that you are a part of. USDA handles raccoons and skunks. So Salt Lake City is part of that. Your citizens can yes. call that number. They'll come and trap those animals and take care of the situation. So we'll make sure they come out to your house and help you. Um, but yeah, you are, you are part of that program. 
And is this is there an added cost or is it? So it, the USDA contract is separate from our regular animal control contract, um, but I believe that pricing is. Yeah, so you pay, you pay approximately $35,000 a year, Salt Lake City does that, and that's year-round um, support from the USDA, and they provide a full-time trapper who does um, raccoons and skunks. And they okay. do provide traps as much as they're, they are available. Um, if they run out, we're happy to provide those to your city as well. Uh, but the residents don't pay an additional cost? That's correct. That's included. Okay, Yes. great. Good yeah. to know. Thank that you. That was a huge campaign issue for me when I ran. Believe it or not, raccoons. Well, this rack, you should see this one. I mean, he's... well, you actually, District 3 actually has a raccoon memorial on 600 North. I don't know if you knew that. Coming down on the right hand side, it's Ricky the raccoon. He's just, <laughs> people put balloons there and pictures. He's just an amazing little man. Raccoon? Yeah, he died. <laughs> <laughs> I okay, that I'm not. Here, yeah. that was somebody's one, can, can council, me, council member Mendenhall. But first, I don't know. I don't know if I'm the only one that is like mentally reliving the Parks and Rec episode with the raccoon that would not leave Leslie Nope alone. Now I just think of this huge <laughs> raccoon eating Chris's cat food. <laughs> so thank you, thank you for I that. I believe that raccoon's name was Poopy. Poopy? Yeah, from Parks and Rec. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. So, wow. uh, Council Member Mendenhall. Usually it takes late into the night for us to get like this, but I think it's just <laughs> a response to the, some stress we've been feeling. And, and I'm going to continue with it because I, I think what I'd rather see is a fund or some program at the city. Noel, you'd be great at running this. That helps residents... <laughs> That helps residents protect their roof areas and other, so that the raccoons don't get in a nest here. But we're living in their house here, and, and maybe if you call the USDA, they're going to kill it. So maybe you should just accept that you have a raccoon neighbor and you subsidize his groceries, and just let it be. Let it be. To, to add to it, I have a friend who trapped two raccoons, and now he has rats. <laughs> That's cool. So, but your cats should help yes. with that. So. Your cat should help. You might need a few more community cats. I don't know. These but. cats. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay. Other questions or comments? So, yeah. Councilmember Mendenhall. Uh, 25,000 more. Did you already say why? So our increases, you guys have been in the same contract for several years, and so your service level has actually gone up over the last several years. You just haven't been paying for it. And so this is the first time that we are renewing your contract, and that's why the price is reflective of your actual usage and the service that you're, you are getting. I, I milked all the extensions we could. <laughs> what? <laughs> I used all of the oh, contract extensions okay. That I so, could. but when Jan I says had to go we aren't getting any additional service, maybe it's that over the term of the contract that's ending, our service actually grew. Correct. So you have been getting more service than you are paying for for the last few years. So We'd that's like and to that's continue doing that. Well. Yeah. Possibly. <laughs> so, and, and that's really what it is, is that your guys' contract um, is, has now expired and we're just moving to the actual price of the service. And we've moved forward with every single city we serve doing this to make sure that everyone is treated fairly, everyone pays fairly the exact cost. So you are being treated the exact same as every single city that we serve. I would like to, as uh, not conditional on this, on the approval of the interlocal, but I... Uh, my husband and I were recently trying to trap a raccoon to then humanely um, release on the other side of the Wasatch Mountains <laughs> for another county to deal with. Yeah. <laughs> so that it couldn't run back to the neighborhood. I'm not going to kill it. Anyway, and it was, I'd never found the USDA link. I saw that the county will provide cages. Um, and I never got so far as to find that I could have called the USDA. So I'm curious if you could give us a utilization, uh, some data on Salt Lake City residents um, utilizing that $35,000 extension or component of our contract because 
Um, yeah, we are happy to give you that information, and we'll make sure that all of you have in hand their contact information as well. This is a, a newer program. We've only had it for about five years, so it takes some time for That's people to time. learn about it. Um, but, but with time, the more people that know about it, the more that people that will utilize it. And they are really quite busy during the summer months, um, and Salt Lake City does have a lot of raccoons, but um, we just want to make sure that it's handled and completely taken care of for you guys. So you'll get us some data. Yep. Thanks. I really like raccoons. I think they're cute. <clears throat> so, yeah. so sorry. Um, any other any other questions or comments? Comments. Comments. We've had a lot of comments. So thank you for putting up with this. Uh, first off, you know, um, and then um, if we have any other uh, questions, we will bring it up at our next meeting. Thank you. Oh, no. If I could just say one thing. Um, with, with the new um, restructure of animal services, um, they've created an advisory board, and I've, um, I'm serving on that now. So I'm visiting um, animal services now almost every month. And, and so it's the first time that we've had a pretty personal contact there. So Great. Um, I have pretty good access now to information and concerns. So I'm a good conduit now. Uh, to sharing with that Thank you, community. That, that, that is actually very good to know. So we appreciate that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is Block 67 North Community Reinvestment Area Plan and Interlocal Agreement with the Redevelopment Agency of Salt Lake City. Uh, this is the item that we just talked about uh, in our RDA meeting. Um, so is... Is Danny on his way down? No, but Corinne, uh, Corinne oh, Corinne is, is here. Okay. All right. Yeah, he told me that Corinne Okay. So Allison Rowland from, is our council policy analyst. Um, Corinne uh, Piazza will, will uh, represent the RDA on this. Um, so Allison. Thank you, Mr. You. Chair. I have a little bit of uh, additional information, which I didn't manage to provide for you last time because I didn't have it sitting in front of me. Um, but let me briefly say this these are the these are two items the two next steps in the block 67 north approval process one is the community reinvestment area project plan which the RDA adopted March 26th of this year so this would be the city adopting its part essentially saying yeah we're willing to direct a certain share of our revenue to this RDA project. So that's one of the items. The second one is the proposed interlocal agreement between the city and the RDA. And that, again, authorizes city tax increment to go to the RDA. The schedule as it now stands is for a public hearing to be held on September 17th, and then potential action on September 24th. In the meantime, on September 17th, there will also be additional public hearings. Um, I'm sorry, in the general public, in the, yeah, even with my notes, I can't quite do it, sorry. Um, <laughs> what I said before is correct. Um, so again, this is the first phase of the Block 67 project, known as Block 67 North. It would be an estimated $90 million in private investment. That said, in the second phase is, is when most of the public benefits, according to the RDA analysis, materialize. And so that's the reason that uh, the council is considering this in two separate steps. And, uh, is, and the interlocal agreements are designed to ensure that those that uh, the benefits from the project, the public benefits, are commensurate with the amount of public benefit that is actually built specifically the garage. Um, so there won't be, there is no risk, thanks to the RDA's negotiation, of the city or the RDA overpaying, paying more than the prorated value of that garage area. I hope that makes sense. Happy to take questions and uh, refer them to Corinne. Um, that is essentially the outline of these agreements. Um, don't know if there are any questions. Questions regarding this agreement? I don't think so. I can so. tell you a story about skunks, <clears throat> That's but okay. I, um, <laughs> I don't but think it's appropriate thank you for your right willingness. <laughs> um, so we will, we set the public or hearing date last week. Um, 
And so the, Did it right now. Yeah, the next one will be September 17th when we will hold that uh, public comment. And we're scheduled for tentative council action on Tuesday, September 24th. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I love the raccoon memorial. I drive by it every day. It's so cute. <laughs> Call me right in the uh, scooter. The scooter, <laughs> yeah. Yep. I live in your district. That's I'm right. always over there. <laughs> okay, the next item on our agenda is an ordinance, uh, the D2 Downtown Support District Design Standard Zoning Text Amendment follow-up. Uh, Russell Weeks is our council policy analyst. Uh, John Anderson is the CAN planning manager, and Nick Norris is the planning director. But I saw Nick earlier, but I don't think Nick's here. Probably yeah, I don't think way. he thought you'd get through that item that fast. So. Yeah, well, you know, I was a little it, surprised it, myself. It, so. it, it is, you know, raccoon, <laughs> raccoons, <laughs> raccoons are quick. So, Russell, turn the time over to you. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Chair, this item, first of all, is up for a public hearing uh, on the on the council formal meeting tonight. Uh, you may recall that at the July 9th session, uh, where where this item was first briefed, that the council uh, uh, wanted said it wanted to have a little more definition to the term affordable housing, and the. Uh, the uh, planners here agreed to that and so they have come back with a proposal that that uh, they should be allowed to present and and uh, uh, to you uh, by themselves and uh, and then there was a third item that uh, came across came to the council staff's attention and that concerned uh, that was involving concerns about the height and length of a fence on uh, 600 South, 200 East, that is actually in a D3 zone and not in a D2 zone, uh, but it borders the D2 zoning, and so it might merit the, the council's attention. All right, um, I can keep this pretty short. I think Russell kind of covered most of it, but. Um, as you mentioned, I think we all agreed that just using the term affordable housing was probably not sufficient, that there should be some definition behind it. So as staff, we met internally with HAND and with the RDA, and um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of valid opinions on both sides, and whether those numbers are 40% AMI, 60%, um, or even lower than that. Um, so I think we kind of realize this is a much larger conversation than what we're having with this one singular zone. Um, the mayor has initiated a petition to create an affordable housing overlay. Um, we're analyzing that citywide. We already do have a project team put together. Um, we're actually going to have public engagement here in the next few weeks with a survey that should come out soon. Um, so as the ball is rolling. You know, we are moving ahead on that. I think we'll have a draft probably early next year. Um, I think, I mean, staff really just thinks that analyzing each zone holistically through this process is probably a better way to do it than to... Um, to add language into the D2 zone right now that will inevitably probably be replaced with something that was fashioned looking at it citywide rather than just this one zone. Um, and so because of that, staff leaves the language which discusses affordable housing. This petition should just be removed at this time rather than approved here and later replaced. I'd be happy right. to answer any questions you have. Yeah, questions or comments? I think we're good. Did you All want right. me to touch on the fence issue or I kind of looked into it let a us know bit. I mean because that that is interesting so where so where was that taken so this is at the facilities the oh this is the one on, this on, is the one on okay and about All second right. east um, he mentioned it so we kind of looked into it there was a permit issued uh, the issue is a six-foot fence is allowed anywhere in the buildable area of a lot so when you have a zone like d3 that doesn't have any required setbacks the entire parcel is then buildable so um, up to six feet and so it like i said it did go through the process it was issued and that would be allowed in basically any of our any zones that doesn't any zone that doesn't have a required front yard setback is going to be allowed to have a six foot fence all the way up to the sidewalk okay um mr chair yeah. i have a question about that does that include any type of fence if somebody wanted to build a cement wall six feet tall they could do that right on the property line on the private have to be completely on your property we do have a list of what it can be a fence i mean you couldn't just get i'm just saying if they were to build nope. a six foot retaining wall and then start building their home right off of that say that's a flower bed well, separating the two. It, it, that's only that doesn't apply in the residential zones right um only in commercial unless the residential zone like an rmu that has a zero setback um but 
it, basically the language in the code says that when located in the front, a fence over four feet in height can't be located within a required front yard setback. Well, if there's no required front yard setback, there's a hole in our ordinance to address that mm. addresses that. It should, it really should read in provided front yard setback. Right. Because then it's whatever, however they decide to do it. So will this ordinance uh, or the text amendment change that? We haven't addressed fencing in this. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I don't. Yeah, I don't know if this is really the the place to do it. I mean, I I raised some issues when I saw that go up. Um, I understand the rationale behind it. I understand uh, why we need to look at it. But I do think that the optics of uh, of a fence, even if it's a, you know attractive for a fence, uh, is still a fence. And when you have the fence go up on on city owned property um, just optically and timing wise with the opening of the resource center um, it it doesn't look good and so this may be something well, I'm, I'll look at the council um, this may be something that we we may want to address not with this text amendment because it doesn't apply but uh, we may want to bring something up later Okay. What would the support would would the council be interested in in, av in having planning uh, research what uh, some of those would look like? Okay. All right. So is that clear? I guess. Yeah. I mean, really, really, what the intention of closing that kind of loophole. hole you pointed because, out? Yeah, because yeah, it, it it is a real issue, and especially for our you know D two zone uh, with the. Um, coming remodel of the LDS temple downtown and you know the removal of that stone wall um, is going to have a big impact and that which is a positive impact because it's going to open up um, the visual lines downtown and I think uh, you know for the city to, to be following suit would be helpful so whatever help you can give us with that I think would be great. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Chair, in terms of the uh, public hearing and going forward tonight, uh, w would the council ultimately like to see a, a an ordinance with the terms affordable housing removed from from the D two zoning ordinance? Council. I mean, I, I would say yes. Okay. But and I and I know Councilmember Mendenhall said that. Um, I don't. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is everyone clear? One more time. Okay. Explain. So say what. So so, so, so explain what removing that. Would so the term the the term affordable housing would be removed from from the ordinance the council ultimately formally considers but it would it, that would be removed in anticipation of a future uh, ordinance that overlays uh, the entire city where affordable housing is is going to be defined and uh, I you know what else defined and what else we'll just address what sort of um you know, what a developer would have to do to be able to, you know, achieve that or to receive okay. any sort of density. Council Member Mendenhall. Well, I, I'm hearing that the overlay is far, far out. Um, and I'm, I guess I'm reluctant to take it out of the D2, take that language out of D2 too far in advance of the overlay happening, so. Because it's not in there currently, and so that would just be in this proposal with the design standards that we've been... What's the proposed now. timing for the overlay? I mean, it's probably early next year at least. That's pretty fast in city time. Yeah. Well, we, we've actually been working on it for probably six to nine months. So we've done a lot of research. Now we're starting to go through a public engagement process and trying to figure out what incentives we can work into our code and writing that code and then um, going through the planning commission process. So in light of that time frame, Councilmember Mendenhall, do you still want that removed? Okay, so leave it in. Do I want the provision of exempting the design review process? For now, it makes, without that definition, it makes it really challenging for us to apply that um, because we don't have any guidance in our code. 
um, we have a very similar provision that exists right now in our parking chapter and the way we've applied it is that they have to be part of some sort of funding program they have to demonstrate that they're affordable um, they can't just come in and say well we we're affordable so it's usually tied to a, a loan of some kind but there's nothing in our code that says that that's just what we have made made the call absent the guidance in our code I'll change my mind again. <laughs> okay. Go. So it was out, or it was in, then it was out, now it's back in. Now it's out, All right? <laughs> Is that right? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I may have exaggerated the back and forth <laughs> there a little bit. Okay, but we're gonna, but we're gonna leave it out, I think, cause I, and, and based on, on your explanation there. So, so when this is up for, uh, for formal consideration, that provision that, that Nick just talked about will be absent in the uh, in the ordinance. If it, yeah, with the with the understanding that planning is working on an overlay that will address right. uh, that issue in a in a much more um, effective way. Right. right. Okay, Councilmember Valdemoros. Nick or John, can you give us like a um, a practical ex like example of how this would work without the without that language, like an application you, comes in? So basically, if, if without that language, um, it means any, any development that's over that height has to go through the design review process. Okay. That's all it means. All right. Uh, if the language were to be in there, it would exempt an affordable project that had a certain percentage of dwelling units. Um, it would exempt them from the design review process. They still have to meet all the design standards, just not the design review process. Okay. So like the height is still achievable, of course. They would just have to go through the process. Yep. So so just for my own information, if that if the term is out, if that provision is out, then everybody who goes through a, any developer who has a uh, uh, building sixty five feet and higher will have to go through a design review process. Correct. Yes. And that's actually how it currently is. Right. Okay. 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 Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. So we have uh, some board appointments, but they're scheduled for uh, five o'clock. But oh, Mike Vela is here. Hello. So if you want us to wait until five o five, we can, or we can interview you now. Okay. If you're if you are ready, Mr. Vela, let's uh, come forward. Um, this is a. a Recommended appointment to the Historic Landmark Commission, uh, Michael Vela. Uh, Mr. Vela, if you'll uh, tell us your background and why you are interested in serving on the Historic Landmarks Commission. Um, I am a registered architect. I've been registered since 1976. Uh, I, uh, I'm a principal shareholder with HKS Architects. Been with them for 35 years. Uh, 20 years ago, I was asked to open up the Salt Lake City office, um, and uh, we've, we've run a successful uh, architectural firm uh, for the last 20 years. Uh, I've been in this room on a number of occasions for different projects involving uh, the Eccles Theater, uh, Bravenel Hall, Ballet West, Capitol Theater, on and on. So, um, you know, history is important, and I think it's important to to remember the uh, the historical fabric of of the, um, of the buildings that were built by by people uh, ahead of us, and it's important to maintain that fabric uh, for for the city. Um, I've been involved with uh, historical work on and off for the last 35 years in different parts of of the country. Um, it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting work, and it's. I, I just think it's important that that we not bulldoze our history, and that we not bulldoze the uh, the things by the people who who made all of everything here possible, and that's why I'm interested in it. Great questions for Mr. Vela, uh, Councilmember Mendenhall. Hi, thanks for being willing to volunteer. Please. What? Yes. Thank you for being willing to volunteer. I, there, this is a, in some ways a contentious board in the public conversation as it has decision-making authority. 
uh, much like our planning commission does. And I wonder if you have an opinion about uh, the Historic Landmarks Commission as it is situated today to make decisions in, real, in conversation with developers versus a uh, future uh, that some people are pushing for to remove that authority and make them a recommending body instead. You know, I've, I've been on, on both sides of the argument, uh, working with developers that, that want to take down a building. Uh, as architects, we, we try to push as much as we can, and sometimes we're, we're very influential that, that there's a value to existing buildings much more than, than can be built. Um, you know, I, I'll give a, an example of, of the Capitol Theater. Um, we, we built the, the Ballet West immediately adjacent to it. We didn't try to replicate it, but we, we wanted it to, to be uh, compatible. And I think that's the argument, and I've used that argument and I've used that example over and over with different developers across the country that um, there's, there, you can combine old and new effectively. And in fact, I think there's, there's a growing appetite for doing exactly that. And I think there's, there's things that we can show as architects that uh, there's value to, to the existing buildings and how much more it brings to the, to the, to the project if it's done effectively. So that was, a, that was a, a little, it sounds to me like perhaps you may be uh, flexible in the type of complementary, if you see it as complementary, uh, new architecture adjacent to, connected to uh, existing historic architecture? I think you have to be flexible, uh, period. You just have to be. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a point where, where it needs to be fought for, and then there's a point, uh, a, a balance past that point where it's, it's more expensive than, than it is. Uh, you know, it's always a value proposition, and you, you have to, to ask yourself, what, what is the value that I can bring if I can bring this building back? Or is it so much money that, that, that you're pouring into it that economically, it, from that point on, it's, it's just not a viable project? And so there, there is a tipping point where that, that has to be paid attention to, I think. But being flexible, absolutely. Thanks for entertaining my questions. Other questions, uh, Councilmember Wharton. Yeah, how do you feel about uh, pump houses? I, I, I'm sorry. I, 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 <laughs> it was a joke. I was saying, how do you feel about pump houses? I don't know if you followed pump that. Houses? A pump house, yeah. It's a Tell very me exactly what a pump house. Is. <laughs> well, uh, none of us knew should, either until. Funny you should ask. Um, but I, I am curious about um, you, you, uh, a lot of my residents come before the Historic Landmarks Commission because um, I represent the avenues the, and the Capitol Hill. Um, some of the older areas of the city, um, and uh, I, you know, I guess in particular, this situation that I'm talking about, the pump house, is sort of emblematic of some of the issues that are going to come before, um, which is that there's a well that has to be brought above ground for engineering reasons, um, and the community, the the house that's been designed around the well, is. Um, more of a modern structure, but this is in the middle of the park leading into Memory Grove. Um, and a lot of the residents feel that it's out of place there because it's very contemporary um, as opposed to incorporating historic elements. Mm. Um, so uh, I guess, uh, I, I mean, do you, have any, do you have any thoughts about that just at the outset? Or well. do you want to reserve until that comes back before the Historic yeah, Landmarks I, Commission? Obviously, I don't have any preconceived notions about what needs to be done because I would have to, to study it a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it sounds exactly like what, what you say. It's, it's, it's pumping water. Um, mm -hmm. Ironically, my, my thesis project was, uh, was historically renovating uh, uh, the, one of the pump houses in Dallas, Texas, one of two, mm -hmm. that, uh, into, into a, a, an office. So I, you know, I, I don't have any preconceived notions, quite frankly. I would just have to study it. Uh, I understand, I think, if I, if I understand, I think the argument, you know, it's historical. Uh, it's being brought up, but there's nothing there now. And uh, I think all architecture ought to pay attention to the environment that it's being built in and respect that. 
And so I would think that whatever, quote, the design is, would want to pay attention to to all of the neighbors and, and be something that, that's not a red herring and would want to fit in, in its environment. Great. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Valdemoros. I just wanted to say thank you, Michael. Hi. Thank you, Michael, for, for um, once again volunteering <laughs> at, you know, at, um, at a board. I sat with Michael this last January at a class um, where we uh, were critiquers, I guess, of student projects, and I, I've seen his work, and I'm excited that you're going to hopefully be um, volunteering in the landscape. Uh, sorry, the, the Landmark Commission so District 4 as well has a lot of historic uh, buildings and having an architect like, like Mr. Vela here will be such a good um, <clears throat> addition for, for educating the public about historic preservation in our community and the flexibility sometimes we have to have so that the community moves forward. So. Thank you, Michael, for, again, volunteering more time. <laughs> Thanks. If there are no further uh, questions or comments, Mr. Vela, thank you very much. Uh, you are on our consent agenda in our formal meeting. You're welcome to stay. Uh, that meeting is at 7 o'clock. However, you are not uh, required to stay. It happens really fast. So thank you for your willingness, and we look forward to your service. Thank you very much. Thank it's you. Good seeing you again. <clears throat> okay. We have... We're waiting for a couple of other people, and I apologize that I, if I don't recognize faces, but is Jessica Ma here? You are Jessica. Okay, Jessica, if you, if you, you could come forward uh, and join us at the table. Uh, Jessica is being appointed to the Historic Landmark Commission as well. Uh, Jessica, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and why you would like to serve on that board, we would appreciate it. Sure. Um I am a lifelong Salt Lake resident. I uh, love the city, of course, and um, I'm a student of architecture. I work for an architecture firm, so um, you know, part of uh, um, part of my job duties have been um, working with the Historic Landmark Commission, um, you know, with special exception processes and certificate of appropriateness, things like that, um, and. As I've been doing this work, I have, you know, really found that um, I think I, I respect the historical character of the city even more, and I appreciate what the Historic Landmark Commission has done in hoping to preserve um, the character of the city, especially while we're going through so much growth. Um, it just felt like, just felt like up, up my alley, something I wanted to be a part of. Um, like I said, especially during the growth of the city to make sure that we're respecting the historical character of Salt Lake. Great. Uh, questions for Ms. Ma? Thank you very much for your willingness. Uh, that was probably the toughest interview you've been through. Uh, we, but seriously, we really appreciate your, your willingness to do this. The Historic Landmarks Commission uh, is a really important board, especially f as we you know, move forward with as much development as we are in the city. Um, so thank you for your willingness to do that. As I mentioned with Mr. Vela, uh, your name is on the consent agenda. You're welcome to stay, however you don't need to. Um, and we appreciate your willingness to serve. That's really it. So, there you go. I was nervous for nothing. Yeah, you were, see? <laughs> All right, thank you, so. Um, we're really not that scary. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> um, so I guess, uh, I, so if I wanted to be present while you all were sure. discussing it, come yep. back at seven. Come back at seven o'clock, and that, the consent agenda is, or the consent um, list is usually at the end of the agenda, so um, I'm not sure how long our meeting is gonna go, but uh, you are, but you are more than welcome to stay. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all so much for your thank time. You. Thank you. All right. Um, is Mr. Schulte here? Mr. Schulte is not here yet. How about um, John Lee? John. And uh, John Lee is uh, before us uh, to be appointed to the Planning Commission. Mr. Lee, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in the Planning Commission. Um, well, I've uh, been doing construction, architecture, and fabrication for about, oh, 17 years now. Um, 
came to Utah about seven years ago, went to LA for a while um, where I was designing community-centric um, multifamily projects as well as a city in Saudi Arabia. Um, so I see a lot of opportunities to create smart cities and to create growth in a downtown, which will also help mitigate some of the issues with traffic and things like that, which I learned the hard way in LA. Um, and really, I'm really interested in breaking down kind of the silos that architects, uh, contractors, uh, developers, city planners all kind of have developed. And I really think we're all on the same team. We want to build buildings for people and for communities. And that's why I want to join. So, Great. Uh, questions for Mr. Lee? Councilmember Mendenhall. What brought you to Salt Lake City? <clears throat> Uh, the recession, really. <laughs> Seriously, uh, yeah, I was in uh, the East Coast, and I just had kind of gotten out of school, and everything had crashed pretty hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always wanted to come west, so we picked Utah and came, and it was an amazing experience. I had never been here before, just moved on a whim, and uh, kind of found a home here. I mean, uh, you can't beat the surroundings, the nature. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean... I came from necessity, but I've kind of come back to build something, so, but yeah. We're glad to have you. Brandon. Council Member Fowler. Thanks. Did you say you built a city in Saudi Arabia? Uh, it was more of a town center. It's okay. about 24 buildings. Um, I was part of a team. There's a team in India, a team in Saudi Arabia, and a, a team in Dubai, but I was helping manage those things, and then I left that to come here to start my own office, so. That's great. Um, you know, the planning commission certainly makes a lot of recommendations and decisions, and I think we're at a point in time where we need, not that there aren't already on the planning commission, but just that development in general needs creativity and um, kind of new ideas and fresh uh, approaches to things. And so I, I think your experience throughout other parts of the country and the world will will bring in some of those creative ideas, and I look forward to that. So thank, thank you. you, and thanks for volunteering your time. Yeah, thank you. Other questions, uh, Council Member Johnston? I admit it, it's been a while since I, I did a resume, but yours is very, um, it's creative. I haven't seen anything like it before, um, especially the uh, skill set at the bottom. Yeah. yeah, I like that. A lot of video games there. <laughs> <laughs> So kudos right. to you. No, thank you. Um, so the only thing I have to say is that so I served on the Planning Commission for a couple of years prior to running for the City Council, and I absolutely loved it. So it, it is a great, um, a great commission to be a part of. Um, there is a lot of information, you know, that you'll, you'll be digesting, but, you know, it sounds like you are, um, you know, a perfect candidate for that job because you obviously like detail and detail is going to be critical so uh, congratulations and <clears throat> as I mentioned to the other uh, uh, appointments uh, you will be on the consent okay. next uh, in our formal meeting uh, you're not obligated to stay but we appreciate your service great well I appreciate so, you thank, thank you, you. Um, okay Mr. Uh, Thaddeus Schulte I know just just came in um, Thaddeus is appointed to the uh, Community Development and Capital Improvement Programs Advisory Board. So Mr. Schulte, if you can tell us about yourself and why you would like to serve on this board. Sure. Um, yeah, so I um, am from Utah originally, um, spent probably about half of my life in Utah, um, most of which has been in Salt Lake County. I went to school down in UVU for my undergrad. Um, after finishing my degree there, I served um, in the Peace Corps um, in Rwanda for two years. Um, I was there as an education volunteer teaching English um, in a rural secondary school. Um, but in the Peace Corps, you also have lots of opportunities to pursue secondary projects and other interests. So um, I was able to um, participate in some grant projects in that capacity and um, was able to write um, a couple grants and w um, got two grants funded um, for some community community development projects in Rwanda there. Um, since then I've come I came back to Salt Lake after I finished uh, my time in Rwanda 
Um, I'm currently working at Western Governors University um, and pursuing a master's degree there in data analytics. Um, and my, my girlfriend actually I met in Rwanda and she worked for the city, uh, for Salt Lake City um, in public services um, for the past uh, three years and she just started an MPA program in Syracuse. Um, so I've always been interested in um, learning more about um, the government and local government and how it operates and um, I think this um, this board gives me a great opportunity to both learn but um, volunteer and contribute. Great. Uh, questions for Mr. Schulte? All right. Well, you've heard the drill. Thanks for your uh, willingness to serve. Um, you'll be on the consent agenda across the hall and, you know, the CDCIP board is actually, I mean, it's a great board because you'll see it really will connect you to all of the neighborhoods in the city as these applications come in. Um, and, and it's actually a really exciting board. So enjoy. Excited. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I still have not heard from Miley Yang. Um, so we will, we can, yeah, we can, so I, I won't, I won't, yeah, we, we won't adjourn. We'll just take a recess um, until uh, Ms. Yang comes back and then we'll, we'll interview her and then adjourn for the formal meeting. All right, thanks. Miley Yang, if you want to come up to the table. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you are interested in the Human Rights Commission. Yeah, um, so I um, am from Wisconsin originally, but I did my undergraduate at the University of Utah. Um, and after graduating, uh, worked with Mountain Land Head Start down in Utah County, um, and then at Catholic Community Services um, for a few years before moving back to the Midwest. Um, so I lived in Minneapolis for a couple years where um, I was able to take advantage of a lot of leadership opportunities there. Um, I was part of a Hmong women's leadership cohort where I worked on um, a project creating equitable spaces for divorce uh, Hmong women and uh, making changes within the culture and um, and uh, the spaces that Hmong women lived in. And, um, and then I also uh, was able to be a part of a program through CIRAC, which is the Southeast Asian Resource Center, um, which is a national organization that lobbies um, in DC for um, policies that affect and benefit um, the Southeast Asian community. Um, and I learned a lot about uh, being involved within uh, my city that way. And when I moved back to Salt Lake, I wanted to continue on being involved and um, find opportunities to keep on using what I had learned, um, even though there wasn't as big of a Southeast Asian population, but still feeling like I could bring a lot to the table. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for your advocacy and, and yeah. all the work you've done. Uh, any questions for Ms. Yang? Yeah, Council Member Mendenhall. Thank you for being willing to serve Salt Lake City and as a volunteer in this capacity. And the Human Rights Commission is a great group. We want to hear from you. We want feedback from the Human Rights Commission. And I hope that you enjoy your time serving on the board. Thank you. Great. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, right here. Uh, Council Member Wharton. Yeah, thank you for um, being willing to do this. So I um, served for two terms on the, um, on the I almost said historic landmarks, Human Research, <coughs> Human Rights Camp Commission. Got it, I got it. Um, and it was a great experience. And I think it's one of our really underutilized boards. So um, rather than uh, ask you a question. I just want to um, encourage you and um, challenge you to, once you get your feet wet and get in there and and, and kind of see what what the commission's all about. That I hope that you'll find new ways uh, to uh, make that commission 
uh, bigger and to, to really leave your mark on it. Um, and I hope that you'll come back to the city council if there's anything that you think that we can do to help advance human rights in Salt Lake. Great, thanks. Great. Uh, so again, thank you for your uh, willingness to serve and congratulations on your appointment. Uh, your name will be on our consent uh, agenda next uh, in our next meeting at seven o'clock. Okay. Um, it's at the end of the meeting. You don't have to stay uh, and you don't need to be present to win. You've already won. <laughs> uh, so uh, if but but you're welcome to welcome to stay. All right. So thank you thanks so much. for your willingness to serve. Yeah, I appreciate right. it. Thank you. Um, so at this point, uh, we will have uh, announcements from the executive director's designee. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So there's just two brief announcements. The first is just a uh, notice of an opportunity for council members to comment on the airport master plan. There are gonna be two meetings on November 13th um, and council members can attend either one. We do have to balance it out with um, ha making sure there's not a quorum of council members. So if you could just let staff know if you're interested in either or both. Um, actually it would probably be either, um, let us know on November 13th. The other item is uh, an agenda for council and RDA leadership to meet with the school board leadership. Um, right now the agenda items that council members have provided are speed boards around schools and crossing guards. If council members have any other items that they'd like to add to that agenda, just let staff know and we can Jennifer, do that. Mm -hmm. one thing that, um, that I do think we need to add is the potential annexation that the county, oh, Salt Lake right. County mm -hmm. is looking at. Uh, with North Salt Lake, uh, which would have a definite impact on the school district. Um, when I spoke with a school board member last night, they were uh, unaware about the annexation uh, as well, uh, and we were also unaware until last week. So uh, let's have that on we'll our agenda that. for sure. Yep. Uh, two discussions last week. One was the um, North Temple education funds that are not going to be used for a new school. They propose to the RDA some other uses of those. So we have some feedback going back to them. Um, you may want to see that before you come back. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. State Street and Nine Line, right? Okay. I added a few items. I talked to Jan this okay. morning. Okay. Great. Thank you. That's it. Okay, um, so at seven o'clock we will um, convene as the Board of Canvassers uh, to uh, formalize the uh, election results from the primary. Uh, immediately following that we will have our formal meeting. Um, so we'll just, we'll go from there, but we will uh, reconvene as a board of the Board of Canvassers at seven o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>